Hello, welcome to the Sunday Science Q&A, uh, which we do pretty much every Sunday, with a couple of exceptions, and both those exceptions have been because we've been doing other big shows. We did a show at the Cheltenham Science Festival, uh, and we also did our um, Sea Shambles, which was uh, originally a show we are going to be doing at the Albert Hall. All of those things are still available online, as are all of the uh, Sunday Science Q&As and everything else that we do. Um, today is Dinosaur Day. It is one that people have been hankering for. I was talking just before we, we started this saying why haven't we done dinosaurs yet and the reason is if you keep people waiting long enough it's like colonel tom parker with elvis he used to put on just you know barbershop quartet after barbershop quartet until people were tearing up the seats and in many ways by doing theoretical physics for a few weeks those have been our barbershop quartets and now we move to dinosaurs which you can all have uh, great fun with hopefully you've had a lot of fun with theoretical physics as well uh, and uh, today we'll meet, be meeting shortly it's dr susie maidman and uh, professor paul barrett uh, and uh, i'll just just tell you a few things quickly that you might need to know one is that you've if you have any we've been sent loads of questions which is great uh but also if you want to ask live questions you can do that you just go to you can tweet us at at cosmic shambles uh so just at cosmic shambles or you can also just ask live questions in the live chat as well and we'll try to get through as many of those as possible uh please also remember uh if you are able to and you can pop some money in the tip jar that is fantastic uh, as you all know and many of you will also be in this situation i imagine uh, a lot of us who are involved in this project don't have any work anymore our diary has been a very obsolete uh, mechanism uh, this year so by because we kind of fund all of this ourselves if we are able to get support either through the tip jar or even better if you're able to support via patreon that means we can keep making four to five shows a week and we have some new things coming up soon as well um, we're going to be doing uh, a series of conversations with uh, scientists more often than not attached to a book they've got out i think the first one we're going to do is going to be Paul Nurse. Paul Nurse, who is a wonderful, very witty, funny, and incredibly uh, intelligent human being, uh, won the Nobel Prize for uh, his, his his work on on cells, which we will be talking a lot about. His particular uh, a discovery, this discovery that led to the Nobel Prize, was originally put in the bin by him, and uh, then when he would finished his dinner, he thought, Do you know what that. That, I'm just going to go back because I don't know if I should have put that in the bin and he was quite right to return to his bin so that's one of the things is always before you throw the rubbish out sometimes have a rifle around there might be something with the potential of a Nobel Prize there also hopefully we're going to because this is my show and tell for the day Joe Marchant's new book The Human Cosmos which I'm enjoying uh, enormously and you can find out more about that so we're going to be doing more science stuff obviously book shambles uh, we've got uh, Kat Arnie's going to be joining us uh, and various others uh, we've also got Genetic Shambles that's still going out and uh Festival of Spoken Nerd have launched uh, a podcast. If in any way you have ever even brushed past one of Festival of Spoken Nerd without even knowing who it was, you probably know about the fact they've got a new podcast. They are quite amazing at the way they manage to disseminate information, but uh, do uh, keep up to date with their new stuff they're doing. Also, the final episode of the Atlantis series with Chris Hadfield and Lucy Green that went out this Friday, and that was all about space weather, and you can catch up with that um, and we will be some of the donations uh, that we make today that if you give us today we're going to give them towards the uh, etc theatre somewhere where I've done many many shows over the last 20 years tiny little pub theatre a wonderful place for developing ideas and a lot of people started their careers there when they were first doing uh, shows as well and finally next week it's chemistry week and so we've got former uh, Christmas lecturer uh, R.I. Christmas lecturer Suffol Islam and uh, Andreas Seller as well um, so Let's start the show. I'm sorry, that was uh, about three minutes, 20 seconds long. I did it as quickly as I could. Helen Chersky, you're with us first. You have not, by uh, the look of you, uh, been cycling for 80 No, today I've had an actual restful day. And actually what I have been doing is reading Joe Marchant's Human Cosmos. And it is a you? superb book. Uh, I, I just finished just before this. And it takes, I, I love books, but it takes a lot to really impress me. And this one really did. So um, it's, it's it's just come out, I think, through a, two, one, a week or two ago. But yeah, highly recommended. So I'm doing a podcast with her next week. Uh, that's why I read it. But yes, so that's brilliant. But I'm not going to tell anyone what's in it because it will spoil well, the Cosmic Shambles, um, book shambles. Well, about not necessarily. It. I mean, there are cakes in it. There are, in it. there are henges in it. There and are, you know, Kalanish really... Stone Circle in there. There's, it's, it's kind of a book which is about our reaction and interaction uh, with the uh, with the cosmos, isn't it? In, but the in... brilliance of it is how it develops 
through the ways that we've cut the universe out of our life and it concludes at the end that perhaps it's coming back in ways ways we didn't expect you have to kind of read it the argument is very it's 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 very detailed anyway that's a great thing i do have a show and tell but um i have a show and tell which is sort of here to highlight the absence so we're doing dinosaurs i brought a fossil and uh, it's an ammonite i think the point is, it's the only fossil I have. And the reason that I'm showing it to you is that when I was seven or eight, that generally I hated the question, what are you going to do when you grow up? Because my response was, I'm not going to grow up. And I was right. And I thought it was a stupid question. Um, so, but if anyone, there was a period, I went through a proper dinosaur phase. And um, so if you'd asked me then, I would have thought I'd have lots of fossils wherever I was living. And I don't. And the reason I don't is that, the study of dinosaurs has changed quite a lot. So, you know, maybe I sound old, but when I was a kid, what you got, if you were a dinosaur mad kid, you got a book, it had a load of scaly things in it and they had names. And if you were lucky, it had when they lived. And that was the limit of the information about dinosaurs. And I was really frustrated. Like the reason I became a physicist is I want to know how it works. Like, why does it look like that and not like this? Why has it got a neck like that? Why, you know, why has it got scales? And nobody ever answered those questions. And basically, that is why I didn't become a paleontologist. It's because there was no functional, like, this is how it works stuff. And the brilliant thing about the study of all fossils since is that it has become much more functional. They, people now have answers to why did it look like this and not like that? Why did it evolve in this way? Um, and how did those paths, how did it work? Why did it fit into this ecological niche? So so in a way, so my show and tell here is a is a reminder of what I didn't become, but it's also a reminder of the way that the, the type of person who, because then it was mostly about classifying things. When I was a kid, the message I got was, this is about putting things in boxes. And now it's a functional science of how can a creature survive on Earth? And it's so much more interesting. And I really wish that all the answers that Paul and Susie had have now were available then, but they weren't. So I've just got my fossil, my fossil. Well, we're going to make sure that we magnify that sense of regret over the next hour, uh, aren't we, Susie? The, um, Susie, what today. is your show and tell today? Uh, hello, everybody. My name is this, which is actually it's it's a car. It's a, a 3D print. Actually, it's not a real fossil. Um, like Helen, actually, Paul and I uh, don't have our own fossil collections at home. We're not allowed them because we work at the Natural History Museum and all the fossils um, should be in a, in a museum and not in our homes. Uh, but this is actually a 3D print of the thumb spike of a dinosaur called Mantellisaurus, which is kind of like Iguanodon. Um, you might be familiar with Iguanodon. Um, and this is cool for lots of reasons. Um, firstly, uh, this is actually from one of the most complete dinosaurs um, ever to have been found in the UK. Um, it's a dinosaur that's on display in the Natural History Museum in our in our main hall. Um, and last year uh, we took it, we opened the case that it's in. We took it all apart overnight. Um, we. 3D scanned all of the different bones um, in front of the public. So whilst talking to the public and telling them what we were doing. And then once we'd finished it over three days, it was extremely hot as well. So it was in August. And then we put the, put the overnight, we put all the bones back together again. And the reason that we did this is that we now have a digital copy of the dinosaur. And this is amazing because it means we can share it with researchers all over the world. Um, we can study it virtually and we can do really cool things with it. So like Helen was saying, we can understand how the dinosaur chewed, uh, how the dinosaur ate, uh, how it moved. We can do all sorts of interesting biomechanical type analyses um, with this virtual skeleton that we have. And we can also 3D print it. Um, uh, another cool thing about Mantellisaurus and Iguanodon haunted dinosaurs, these ones with the thumb spikes, um, when this bone was first discovered, these dinosaurs are from the Wealden of Sussex and the Isle of Wight. So um, they're, they're important to me because I live in Sussex. So um, this is kind of my local dinosaur, if you like. And um, they... When these dinosaurs were first discovered, they found this and they thought they didn't find the rest of the bones or where it fitted on the skeleton. They just found kind of a random selection of bones. And they were like, well, I wonder where this goes. Kind of looks a bit like maybe a rhinoceros horn or something like that. Or So they just they put it on the nose of the dinosaur. Um, and it wasn't until some time later that they actually found the complete skeleton with all its bones in the right place that they realised that it was actually a thumb spike. So there you go. That's my show and tell. That's brilliant. Paul, what are you going to show and tell for us this afternoon? This afternoon, Mine's going to be a fantastic disappointment after <laughs> both of those, to be honest. And again, mine has, at first sight, very little to do with the dinosaur. And it's this object here, uh, this little piece of pottery. And this, for the alcoholics among us, will know that this is actually a sake cup. Uh, and this sake cup, though, does have a direct link to dinosaurs. 
as it was made out of the rock that once surrounded a dinosaur fossil. So I was very lucky a few years ago to be involved in a big project in Japan, helping to dig up Japanese dinosaurs and to work out what types of dinosaurs were living in Japan. And Japan, uh, it's a big island, but it doesn't have that many places you can find dinosaur fossils. But uh, my Japanese colleagues and Japanese people in general are nuts about dinosaurs, playing on huge international expos, and so they're really excited to find dinosaur fossils in Japan. And this is a place that was actually found by tunneling a new road. So they're building a road tunnel, the rocks came out, had lots of little dinosaur teeth and so on in. And so if you imagine like a rock breaking yard with people sitting around and basically chipping away at these lumps of rock from this tunnel, occasionally they would find these really beautiful dinosaur teeth that were able to tell something about Japanese dinosaurs. And the village next to this road tunnel, a place called Shiramane, uh, on the main island of Japan, also has a potter that works in the village. And when he found out about this, he came down, took away a load of the spare rock, uh, around from around those dinosaur fossils and he made everyone in the team one of these soggy cups as a as a souvenir so it's actually a nice way of reminding myself first of all some really nice trips to japan but secondly also is saying that actually we find out more stuff about dinosaurs both by working on the things we already have in museums with all these new amazing technologies, but also by going out and finding new dinosaurs in the field and digging them up. Uh, I thought you were going to say we find out. Uh, more. I thought you were going to say we find out more about dinosaurs by drinking rice wine heavily, <laughs> and then that allows our imagination to uh, come to the conclusions it, of nature. The inspiration part is important. Thank you. They're all great show and tells. This is uh, just a reminder again, of course, if you uh, support us for our Patreon uh, and if you put anything in the tip jar, that's fantastic. We're sharing some with the Etc. Theatre today. And also, if you want to uh, ask questions, you can either go to the live chat or tweet us at Cosmic Shambles. So the first question is uh, from Asim. He says, uh, my boy is obsessed with dinosaurs. It's not really a science question necessarily, but why do you think dinosaurs are, along with space, one of the first areas of science we get so excited by? as kids Susie I'll start with you on that because it is an intriguing thing it, it hasn't changed in you know well the 45 years there is still such excitement about dinosaurs it's just for most kids it's a phase they go through you know you talk to pretty much any seven-year-old and they are crazy about dinosaurs and quite often they know an enormous amount as well often more than me which can be awkward in conversations with my daughter's primary school colleagues um but yeah i, I what is it about them i think that they are big or you know some of them are big the ones that we we t that tend to be famous that they're big they're completely different from anything that's alive today um some of them are clearly you know would have been very big and scary with great big teeth and big claws and i, I just think it's it's that difference between what we have alive today and this they're almost monsters aren't they so i think it, it's just something that really captures the imagination that we just don't have around today at all but yeah it is fascinating well i think that's what it is actually because it i think it's that you know it's, if you look at kids books they're full of monsters they're full of weird things but kids kind of know that those are not real weird, mm. weird things whereas a dinosaur is the closest thing you get to the monster in one of those books walking out in front of you and and or you know interacting with you and so i i think it's that it's like the kids are just old enough at that age to understand what's real and what isn't and yet this is like a dragon walking yeah. out of a book into their reality absolutely uh, I, I had a lovely letter from a the other day um who wrote to me asking me all about dragons and saying that he thought dragons might be quite like dinosaurs and he had a series of questions for me about dragons and was wondering whether i could answer them so i, I sort of tried to swing them back to dinosaurs a little bit um, but yeah i think you're absolutely right you know they are they're, they're like dragons they're, they're, they're the closest thing that we could get paul what do you reckon i'd go along with all of that and there's actually there was an interesting study a few years ago suggesting that dinos knowing about dinosaurs is a way that kids can exercise power over their parents. Because if you think about it, a lot of dinosaurs have a lot of very complicated names, they're quite hard to remember, there's a lot of different types, and the numbers of times that you get as really good questions from kids when you're giving public talks on dinosaurs, really well informed, very insightful questions, and kind of slightly embarrassed parents next to them knowing that they're completely out of their depth. And whenever that poor parent tries to say a dinosaur name and they get it wrong, they get that kind of cold, hard look from the child saying, Mummy, no, 
How stupid are you for not knowing what that triceratops should be and mixing it up with a stegosaurus? And that, that psychologists have suggested that this is one of the few ways in which kids actually do exercise power over the control figures in their lives because it's something they just know more about. So I think that's also part of the attraction. It's something that they can kind of um, have the upper hand in those discussions with adults. Look, all of you, of course, has been so useful because things like the Brontosaurus, th there's a time when you might say to your child, Brontosaurus, and they go, I'm afraid, parent, that is no longer irrelevant. And then you and then it comes back in again. So you have to be on top of this, you know, and most of us are still, you know, for depending on when we grew up, you know, but I'm still stuck in 1978. And so it's... Uh, um, I've, oh, I wish I was because that was just before Margaret Thatcher came in and then everything went uh, anyway so let, let's not get political the children watching but no it was a terrible terrible transition psychologically of the human race uh, to greed and selfishness and it may well be in many ways the uh, the comet that struck the earth and led to our end but anyway on a happier note uh, Kenya would like to know um, you often hear the fact that we are closer in time to a Tyrannosaurus Rex that a Tyrannosaurus Rex is to a Triceratops which is such I mean, it, it, when anyone hears that for the first time and we see when you see the the, the, the lifespan of dinosaurs uh, it, on, a, on a poster, we lose that sense of the enormity of the time that covers in terms of, of living things on Earth or complex living things on Earth. And, and what Kenny would like to know, this completely does my head in in terms of time scale. So my question is, how do you go about getting your head around what seems so utterly counterintuitive? Um, Paul, do you want to stop? No, no not really. Um, <laughs> that's actually a good question. I, I must admit, I don't generally think in terms of, uh, of time, in terms of a quantity. I think in terms of it as a series of events uh, that happen in a particular order. So I don't sit around thinking, my goodness, that was 240 million years ago when the first dinosaur was skipping around. I tend to think of... Uh, almost like a series of layers of layers of rock or layers of cake or something, and thinking of those things and how they stack up through time. So it's, I only tend to think about time in terms of numbers when I'm thinking about how quickly things might have happened, like when I'm thinking about how quickly a feature might have evolved, how quickly a group might have spread from one part of the world to another. And then I do tend to think of it in terms of numbers, in terms of millions of years. But I think it's something you just suddenly start talking about very in a very blasé fashion uh, when you start thinking about these things it's actually just mentally like talking about things in our own lifetime oh something that happened to me 20 years ago seems like a long time ago something that to me that happens 200 million years ago seems like a long time ago but something that was 66 million years ago wasn't that long ago at all and I think I can kind of scale it in my head to the sorts of events that I would look at on a day-to-day -day basis so it's a tricky one though because we are talking about uh, time spans that it's effectively impossible to visualize. I mean, it's bad for us. Think what's bad like someone who works on the Big Bang when they're talking about things that are like 14 billion years ago or something. I mean, it's uh, a crazy number. But that's you think of things like particle physics which is i think what you were saying there is similar to some extent and helen may disagree with me on this but when physicists talk about certain part you know subatomic particles i think our imagination does not in many ways go down to the the sizes we're talking about our imagination creates a framework which kind of makes uh, it, it palatable in the same way as those enormous lengths of time. I mean, Susie, how do you, because I think one of those things with it, within the, the time we're talking about, that I think seems to be one of the problems we have when people don't believe in the idea of evolution by natural selection. It's because it does take a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to get an eye, you know? And, and it, you're absolutely right. It's completely impossible for us to visualize or understand or comprehend the amount of time that we're talking about and that's the problem right you know you, you might say it, it's going to take million you know the, 20 million years 50 million years they had 50 million years to evolve this feature um but somebody's still going but that feature is really complicated but you're going yeah but they had 50 million years to do it that's a really long time, but we can't understand that length of time. And of course, the first paleontologists, when they were first, you know, the first geologists, when they were looking at the rocks, they didn't know, they couldn't absolutely date the, the column. So they didn't know how, how much time there was. Um, and, you know, all they knew was that these rocks at the bottom, they had one lot of fossils in, and then these rocks a bit higher up had another lot of fossils in. And so they named these kind of 
rocks that are characterized by a type of fossil and um, by names that they could use all over the world so things like jurassic cretaceous ones you might be familiar with um, and we use them a lot you know and and i think that's one way that we do, we deal with it is that we all say oh you know this dinosaur's from the middle jurassic um and then another dinosaur's from the late cretaceous so we don't we don't necessarily when we're we're talking to each other or when we're thinking about it we don't we don't have to think oh this this is from 167 million years ago as opposed to 66 million years ago you know we can we have these names that kind of don't blow our minds as much but it's can i ask you sorry Helen, i'm just gonna I, I, i'm gonna come to you and i just quickly that sensation of time i was thinking we mentioned Kalanish, the stone circle at the beginning of this and and that i think as far as i remember it is older than stonehenge so it's uh when i touch that i remember that there's a sensation which for all whatever might be seen as the my mind and reason which is meant to be in my mind sometimes there is a sensation that you feel and i uh, uh, of the the age and of the hands that have been there before do you find uh, Paul and Susie, that there are moments when there are artefacts, there are fossils that you may be handling. And for all of the scientific thinking, there is also a very a, a, a sensation of something about the enormity of this whole of life on Earth and, and of, of the universe. So, Paul, if I start with you. Actually, I get that not so much from looking at the objects, but from looking at landscapes that they come in. So when I go out and I do field work to dig up dinosaurs and I'm looking at these huge badlands uh, in places like South Africa, where I work quite a lot, that's when I genuinely feel like I'm looking at an ancient landscape. I'm looking at the rocks, knowing that they're laid down about 200 and bit million years ago. And that's when I get that kind of spine tingling moment of thinking, you know, what, I'm here now, but what I'm actually here looking at is something that's really ancient. And so I do still get that moment. And of course, the key thing is every time anyone finds a fossil, uh, you are almost certainly the first human ever to have seen that object. So it's a moment of genuine discovery in a way that very few other things are. You're the first person to crack that rock, uh, rock open, literally, that thing has not seen sunlight, probably, uh, since before humans were even kind of on the planet. So those moments of genuine discovery where you get that kind of thing and you realize you're seeing something no one else has seen before, that's your moment where that's a moment of pure discovery. And I think that is still, no matter how often you do this, that is still something that uh, keeps people like me and Susie going. It's that idea that we are um, uh, opening that book, if you like, for the first time and starting to get a new picture of what's going on. Susie? Yeah, or, do you know, I'd never had it before until about uh, last last summer, Paul and I were doing both involved in a dig in America and we were doing some uh, media around that. And I, I heard Paul um, say something similar to what he just said about being the first person ever to lay eyes on on this bone. And I was like, that is really cool. <laughs> wow, That's an excellent point. Um, and so now, actually, yeah, I do. I think it's really cool. But, you know, I never really thought about it before. <laughs> That's it because it does seem to. We, we were talking before, Helen, about you know this a human cosmos, uh, wonderful, but and that does seem that sense of reminding ourselves of the importance of connection beyond the importance of the scientific idea. It's yeah, and it does matter. And I think what I was going to say about the time was that the other time scale to think of it on is the proportion of the age of the Earth. So the Cambrian explosion was 500 and something million years ago. Someone will give me the correct number, but um. You know, and the Earth was four and a half billion years. And so that that's what 11 or 12 percent of the entire life, you know, the time span of the Earth. So it's only right at the end of the Earth that you start getting hard things in the fossil record, right for the last 12 percent of Earth's history. And then within that, the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs are there for what, half of that time. So it's quite a big chunk of of all of the time when things with hard skeletons have existed on Earth. Um, but yeah, that thing, and I think Paul's right about the landscape. It's there's, there's that wonderful thing. And it comes back to that Feynman thing of knowing about a flower, right? That when you have a little knowledge and you look at a landscape and you can see the layers, you know enough to identify the discontinuities, to see that there was something down there and there's something else up there. And you can let your mind zoom out. And it's one of those things where education and science definitely doesn't take away because you do get these moments where, and I find for me, it's it's like, it's like a, a little glimpse. It's almost like um, just being able to see for a second, just being able to focus for a second. And my mind suddenly sees the scale and then it's so enormous that it shuts in again. But I, the glimpse 
you hold on that and so it, it but it makes landscapes so much richer because you see them as four-dimensional and you've got all of that history and that that's a fabulous thing and then you get on to why what was it like like why did they live there and then you have all these other questions so yeah but the experience i think is it's the thing and we're starting to talk about it more in science i think that this yes scientists are supposed to be objective but we're all human so we're not perfectly objective whether we want to be or not but what's the point of being human if you don't get to enjoy the experience? Like, how awful would it be just to be a little robot that just is adding up numbers? So it's really important that along with science, and this is why I think, you know, we were talking with Chris uh, Jackson last week about field work and not losing touch with the field. And of course, lots of people could contribute to a science, but science, you know, we should we should look at the world we're studying and actually experience it as a human at the same time. Otherwise, we'll miss something. Now, now we have thank you very much helen i, I fully agree that, that the um right we've got so many questions we're going to go at super speed we're going to start off with uh carol carol is six years old hello carol why did all the dinosaurs in the sea die as well when the meteor hit so that's uh i suppose it, well, so paul so i'm going to do a little bit of a quick little bit of a quick correction so there are lots of reptiles living in the sea at the time of dinosaurs but they weren't dinosaurs so they were they were different groups of reptiles but they did live at the same time and actually, you're right, a lot of them did go extinct at the same time. So things like the big long-necked marine reptiles like the plesiosaurs, they all died out at the same time. But some of them actually started going earlier. So the more dolphin-looking like reptiles, the ichthyosaurs, actually disappeared about 35 million years before the meteorite. And we don't know why they went at all. They just went. And they really successful group. It's an outstanding mystery. But it wasn't just the marine reptiles and the dinosaurs, but so many other things died at the same time. And we think that one of the reasons they all died at the same time is because for the same reason, which is this great big meteor coming from space and whacking the Earth really hard 66 million years ago. And so many different groups of animals and plants died out at that point. And some of those marine animals were victims of that same event. Thank you, Cheryl. This one's for you, Susie. This is from uh, Tony. Do you think there's fossils of dinosaurs we can't even imagine at the bottom of the sea, but we'll never get there because of the depths? Or are there parts of the ocean that have always been deep ocean, so the likelihood is very slim? Um, yes, that both of those answers. So yes, to both of those answers, there are parts of the oceans that have always been oceans, or that were actually formed after uh, the age of the dinosaurs. So as you know, the Earth, the surface of the Earth is made up of tectonic plates, and these plates are moving around very, very slowly at about the rate that your fingernail grows. So sea floor is being made at um, spreading ridges, mid-ocean ridges, and is being destroyed at subduction zones. And so some of the rocks that were around at the time of the dinosaurs, which which and, and the soils that, that, that held dinosaur fossils may well have been destroyed, um, but both by erosion, um, but potentially by other things, mountain building and, and being squished, um, and the fossils will have completely disappeared. Um, some of the, the oceanic crust at right at the bottom of the oceans probably wasn't, well, definitely wasn't even there at the time of the dinosaurs. Some of it was, um, but that was always right down in the deepest ocean, so that, that won't have any dinosaur fossils in. Um, there are, however, there were oceans that were shallower seas where you have the, the continental crust. So that's the bit which, which is mostly land where you can actually have flooding of that. So if you think about something like the North Sea um, today, that's a shallow sea, which is actually on, con on continental crust. Um, and it, and uh, there would have been oceans at the time when the dinosaurs were alive. Um, but yeah, no, the question was, are they under sea now? So yes, there could have been rocks that were on land at the time that dinosaurs died that are now under these kind of more shallow seas. So there might well be dinosaur fossils under some of these shallow seas. Yes. Now, this next question, I think one half of it you're going to be fine on. I think the other half, I'm not entirely sure. This is from Ari, who's seven years old. Hello, Ari, from St Albans. Uh, Ari would like to know, how long was the Diplodocus around for and how many were there in total? <laughs> it's the second part of the question I think might be tricky. Um, so Diplodocus, so Diplodocus probably around, uh, probably for about four, three, four million years, as far as we know, in terms of where the fossils are found. They all come from uh, what's now the Western US. They all come from Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, that kind of area there, from a set of rocks that were laid down about uh, 150 million years ago, uh, over a period of about four million years, something like that. In terms of the number, though, that's actually a really good question. That is something that we just don't know. Like, we know how many we've got in museums because we can just go and count them. 
but we don't know how many were around alive at one point that we'll never find the fossils from. Uh, so we're not really sure. My hunch would be that they weren't, there weren't thousands of them. My hunch would be that they were living in fairly small herds and that they were moving and traveling around a lot, quite a bit. So, but we don't really know. It's the honest question. Knowing the size, the numbers of extinct animals that ever lived, it's a really hard question. It's one that we tr keep trying to see if we can find ways to work out because that affects how we interpret the ecology of those ecosystems. Uh, is there even a number for how many? Because obviously fossilization whole... is extremely unlikely. Um, so even to get one fossil, there's so many unlikely things have to have happened. Is there any approximate number? And I guess it depends by species, but of all the, di you know, so say that species, which was that, did it live near water? Perhaps a bit more likely to be fossilized. How many, like, is it one in 10,000, one in 100,000? Is there, is there any number for what the probability was of one being fossilized? I'm just going to make a quick answer. No, uh, no. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, come on. You can have a go. It's still a big unknown, unfortunately. It's one of those things that it's very hard to try and find a good, sensible answer to. I thought you were going to do the tricky thing there, Paul, which was you were going to answer uh, the first part and then go. But in terms of numbers, Susie. So uh, that was a very uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've uh, not shown your duplicitous nature. This one is uh, right. Susie, this is from Gurney Harlick, and uh, Gurney would like to know which dinosaur was the hardest. <laughs> like physically, like a shell. I, I, I reckon like, this is. I reckon this is. Uh, you can do both. You can have the I'll physical shell, but I think mainly what they're saying is, is in terms of a fighting machine, uh, in terms of its power of destruction. Okay, I'm going to do the hardest, hardest with the shell thing, and I'm going to let Paul do the the, the fighting machine uh, answer. Is that okay? So there's a whole group of dinosaurs that are some of my favourite dinosaurs. And they're called ankylosaurs, and they're basically um, like little walking coffee tables. They're extremely wide. They've got quite short legs, but they're covered in armour. So um, they've got nobbles and bumps and plates and spikes all over them and even um, spikes on their heads and even their eyelids and some some of the species have have an armor on their eyelids and um, so they were the hardest in terms of you know if you were going to crack one and um, that would be the hardest I'm going to let Paul answer what he thinks is the uh, is, is the, the biggest fighting machine can fighting I just machine. ask can I just ask, though, sorry, sorry, that, obviously so sounds very that obviously sounds very advantageous, but is that one of those things, uh, a bit like sometimes you see these enormous wrestlers, and they're great as long as they're stood up, but once they're knocked over on their back, so is it one of those things that's something that looks tremendously advantageous, once you find the weak spot, that's... We don't know, of course. We, we don't know whether ankylosaurs could right themselves. Um, but they were, many of them were very, very wide and do seem to have very short legs. I do imagine it would have been a problem for them if they were ever knocked over. They said, I would louse thing. I, I, can, I can envisage that. So, Paul. Yeah, it's a tricky one, actually. Yeah, it's I, a tricky one, actually, because I, uh, anyone who knows me knows I have an implicit bias of talking about meat eating dinosaurs. I'm not very keen on them. In general, I think they're stupid glory poster boy dinosaurs uh, <laughs> and just hogging the limelight. Um, so if we're talking about like massive killer death machines, the obvious kind of one to go for is my least favorite dinosaur of all time, T-Rex, um, because it, it genuinely is an impressive, huge carnivorous dinosaur. One of the strongest bite forces of any animal that's ever lived. Every kind of superlative about T-Rex is probably fair to be honest it's just i get a bit sick of hearing about it which is why i have a low opinion but you've also got to bear in mind that although those guys would have gone out and they'd have been pre uh, amazing predators and like completely terrifying they're also a bunch of really big dinosaurs that wouldn't even care about a t-rex like there are some really huge sauropod dinosaurs that weigh like 70 tons they would have just been able to like wiggle their butt hit the T-Rex on the side and like tell it to get going when they were adults. So in terms of being the hardest, they might actually be the hardest dinosaurs because they were able to kind of uh, laugh off an attack from a, even an adult T-Rex just by basically sitting on them. Uh, so they might have been, they, there's an argument for them. Well, I love hard. it's the idea that they might do that by accident. Exactly. It, it doesn't mean they're not the hardest it just means they're the clumsiest as well <laughs> now helen for you brian would like to know you can bring back two dinosaurs as a rewilding exercise for the uk Ooh. which two do you pick for the for the uk yeah wow um well, so I, th I mean, obviously I'm going to set a pick a marine one because I think we don't pay enough attention to 
marine creatures and i think i don't so i there are um so there's a current species now, the Nautilus, which is the last of a line of shelled cephalopods. And the, I've never seen the real Nautilus, but they're, apparently they're beautifully colourful and they're very lovely creatures. And they had loads of ancestors in the fossil record. And so I'm probably going to get picked up on this, but I think the ancestors of the Nautilus would be a great thing to have in our seas just because they would be beautiful objects uh, and they would swim around and they're, they're really striking. So that would make people look in the ocean. And then... On land, I am, you know, as a as a vegetarian, mostly vegan, I am also not very keen on the big meat eating, uh, meat eating things. Um, I like, you know, the ones with the most feathers. So I saw a fossil that came from China. Um, so when I was a kid, when I was in that dinosaur mad phase, there was this massive exhibition of fossils that came to Cardiff, and I was so dinosaur mad that I begged and begged and begged my parents until they took me to the dinosaur exhibition in Cardiff of these Chinese dinosaurs, and um, I saw one of the same fossils again two years ago because they had found it had feathers, and they discuss- So I want to see. I want the dinosaur that has the on it. That's my choice, and the most colourful feathers. See, it's this is a great me. new show. Which Desert Island Discs is always concentrated on music. The idea you're on a desert island and it has no living thing, so you need to rewild in terms of. Say it's got plants, but it hasn't got uh, mammals, reptiles, uh, or fish. That would be yeah. And well, you could pick anything from history. That would be brilliant. Yeah, and then you have to choose which eight you're going to basically uh, coexist with. Uh, this is uh, Sophia would like to know. Um, which dinosaurs had physical ability to use tools? Now, of course, this is an intriguing thing, which is tool use is still such a recent thing. Now, the last, what, 50, 60 years that we've really, of, of any other uh, non, non-human species. So um, can I start with you, Susie? Are, are the dinosaurs we could, at, at the very least, imagine? That's, it's a really tricky question to answer because we, we just don't really have any evidence of that, um, at least for the extinct dinosaurs. Of course, there are the dinosaurs aren't all extinct um, because the dinosaurs, uh, the birds evolved from the dinosaurs. And so in a biological sense, birds are actually dinosaurs. And um, I think I'm right in saying that crows are, for example, uh, and, and birds in that group, um, they do use tools. Um, so probably those dinosaurs. Um, but in terms of the dinosaurs that are extinct is it we just don't have that evidence in the fossil record what we would have to do is look at crows and see whether there's any features in their bones that relate to tool use and then we could go back and look at the dinosaurs and say right can we see those same features in the bones of the dinosaurs because all we have to go on with with the dinosaurs um, is is their bones and sometimes their footprints so yeah, really difficult question to answer. Um, I don't think there's any evidence of that at all at the moment. Now we've got a now we've got a question from Richard, who uh, this is actually a question from his son. And we said before the two things children are fascinated by: uh, space exploration and dinosaurs. And uh, so this question is: How did dinosaurs go to the toilet? As you know, all astronauts will be asked. Yeah, there used to be a rumor that one of the reasons Helen Sharman stopped doing so many public events, uh, whenever it was twenty years ago, was because she didn't want to answer that question anymore. I don't think that is the reason she gave up uh, at that particular point. So, Paul. The, uh, I presume there's more than one way that they went to the toilet, the, the whole light issue. Yeah, so we do know something about how dinosaurs did that because we do find fossilised poo. And we find that particularly for meat-eating dinosaurs, and that's because meat-eating dinosaur poo often has bits of bone in it, and that bone gives extra minerals to their poo that help them stick together and help them turn into rock. So we know a little bit about it, and of course, my least favourite dinosaur has produced the largest ever known fossil poo. So a T-Rex poo is about 45 centimetres long and is stuffed filled with the kind of crunched up bones of the last of the more interesting dinosaurs that it fed on. Um, so we know quite a bit about T-Rex poo, for example. The, what, we don't know an awful lot about poo in the plant-eating dinosaurs, though. And that's because if you think about plant-eating poo, it tends to be something a bit like a cow pat. They're made basically out of crunched up plants and they're very easy to squish into the ground and to get work back into the soil. So we have very much less evidence about the direct diets from fossil poo than we do for the meat eaters. But it's one of those weird lines of extra evidence that we have for dinosaur biology. So we know that dinosaurs were going around leaving their droppings over the landscape and probably like living animals are uh, helping to distribute lots of nutrients across the landscape. If you imagine a big kind of 50 ton sauropod going around, 
I don't really want to paraphrase. I'll paraphrase Jeff Goldblum's immortal line um, from Jurassic Park about that being a big pile of poo. And we're going to have a lot of those big piles of poo dotted around, which is going to move seeds around. It's going to fertilize the soil. So they would have been really important. So we know a little bit about it. Brilliant. Thank you for that question. Now, uh, Robert, age nine, uh, wants to know, why haven't there been anything as big as dinosaurs on land since? Susie. Great question. Um, actually, today, our our ecosystems and our environments today are a little bit unusual because there aren't lots of really, really big animals. And there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of them is us. We probably, humans and early humans, um, actually hunted a lot of what we call the megafauna, which means the big animals, um, and, and made them extinct. Um, but but also there may be climatic reasons. We're living in a, in a time in Earth's history where the climate it's a bit cooler um, and, and maybe that has some impact on these very very large animals not really sure so things like mammoths of course were around up to i believe about as recently as four thousand or five thousand years ago in some parts of um, northern siberia so those sorts of things they, they probably died out as the climate changed and and as the the, the ice withdrew um there have been large animals at other times in Earth's history, but nothing as large as the dinosaurs, as the giant sauropods, the long necked tailed dinosaurs that Paul was talking about earlier, that could have got up to maybe as much as 60 tonnes. Um, just huge, huge, huge animals. And, you know, it's a question we ask time and time again, how and why did these animals get so big? And I'm not really sure that we have a great answer for that. Um, but again, I think Paul's already alluded to one of our best guesses, which is that, you know, these were, these were the way that these animals were built, they probably weren't able to run around very much. So they probably weren't running away from predators. So one way to defend yourself if you can't run away is to get bigger um, so that you don't become a target for predators. So it could be that there was kind of a bit of an arms race, like as the, the herbivores and the, the prey items got bigger, the predators got bigger and the prey items got even bigger and the predators got bigger until we ended up with these absolutely gigantic animals. Brilliant. Thank you very much. This is uh, Jess, is, uh, Jess, who is uh, 11 years old. Jess would like to know, do you think we'll ever run out of fossils? Could we find all of them? Paul? Uh, technically, yes, we could run out of fossils because there's a, a, a set number. There's not a set number, but there's definitely an upper limit on the number uh, because the upper limit on the number is the number of animals and plants that have ever lived. And that's not a, an infinite number. So technically, yes. And also a lot of those animals don't enter the fossil record. Their fossils get destroyed by erosion or they never come to the surface. But to put that into perspective, we're still finding something like 50 new types of dinosaur a year uh, around the world. So once a week, on average, one of my colleagues somewhere is naming a new dinosaur. So that number shows no sign of slowing down. So I think that there is a theoretical maximum that we will eventually find everything, or that at least ev find everything that's in the rocks that we can get to. Um, but equally, I think we've got a long way to go before we get there. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that, that question. This is now Paul Mason's three-year-old has this. Uh, would like to know, which dinosaur was the last dinosaur alive? Susie? Oh, that's a tricky so one. So the dinosaurs w went extinct when this great big asteroid hit the Earth. Um, and we know the sorts of dinosaurs that were around right before that asteroid. So um, there's things like T-Rex and Triceratops and Ankylosaurus are some of the most famous ones. So those sorts of dinosaurs might well have actually seen the asteroid coming in. But as for what is the actual last dinosaur that ever lived, we really don't know. We're not able to, uh, you know, the fossil record kind of smooshes together time. And so we're not able to pick apart really, really, really fine details. Having said that, I do think, and uh, Paul can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the dinosaur fossil that has been found closest to the exact level where the asteroid hit, and we can see that layer because it's got some really weird kind of chemical characteristics in it, um, is a triceratops bone. So I think that's probably likely to be the best guess that we've got there is triceratops. triceratops. Paul, would you agree? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Susie's absolutely right. So that, the, the bone that's closest to that boundary is a big triceratops bone, which um, so it's definitely one of the last dinosaurs around. But again, I go back to what Susie said earlier, dinosaurs are still with us. So it's kind of an odd thought. But when you go out in your back garden or you go to the park or you have chicken for dinner, you're actually looking at a dinosaur. 
Um, so they're still very much around today. It's just all the dinosaurs that are around with us now are relatively small. Most of them fly, most of them have feathers, and we've lost all of the kind of big, really bizarre and funky looking ones. Now, now, Helen, this has been a very bad day for you in terms of the number of questions about <laughs> bubbles. But do not worry. Sophie, in the live chat, has come Is to save you combine bubbles with and a, 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 an, I think it's bubbles in amber based question. Uh, Sophie would like to know there was an article earlier this year, New Scientist, I think, about some amber that paleontologists dug up that had fossilised creature in it and also rare fossilised bubbles. What can we learn from prehistoric bubbles? Uh, so, so I'm clearly not an expert on this specific question. I can I can offer some ideas, and Paul and Susie might correct me. So the first thing is that fossil, like the idea, knowing what was in an atmosphere of the past is a, a fantastically valuable thing, and there's a few reasons for that, and it's partly to do with what. You know, that question of dinosaurs being adapted to live in the environment they've got, the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen, the, the, particularly in the air, are really imp provide a really important limit on what sort of body you need in order su to survive in that environment. And the other thing that um, fossil atmospheres can give you is ratios of other chemicals that let you trace what else might have been going on. So, for example, if we get in, in the ice in Antarctica, for example, we get trapped bubbles of air in the same kind of way. And you can look at the isotopes because they're a bit more recent, but you look at the ratios of chemicals and they can tell you a little bit about sometimes, you know, how much it was raining or, you know, um, how much vegetation of a particular type there was. So you so you get a lot of it's a Knowing about the atmosphere tells you about the, the, the global environment of the time. So that's why they're valuable. Um, so the amber I don't know about, but the other thing I'll just say before I let to one of the experts uh, give a proper answer is that the hardest thing when it comes to these atmospheres is knowing that this, this little, you've got a little pocket of gas and it's in some amber and you're like, oh, that's really cool. If I open that up, a, whole, a, pa a pocket of the past is going to leap out at me. And the question you have is, has it been altered? If it's been sitting in that amber for 50 million years or 200 million years, you know, chemicals do move around and very slowly things can diffuse in and out. So the first question you've got to ask is, in all the vast amount of time that thing has been sitting in there, has anything sneaked in or has anything sneaked out? And, and I, I don't know. Amber is more chemically reactive in a lot of ways than ice, so it's probably a lot harder to tell. But if you could get at those, it's absolute gold dust when it comes to re like writing the history book of Earth because there's so much fun. We've got lots of ways of getting at some of those things, but nothing is as good as an actual sample. And now I'm sure Paul or Susie will have something cleverer to say about that. Uh, Paul, Susie, anything more on amber bubbles? No. Brilliant. You've covered that, Helen. This is uh, now Harshal. Uh, uh, the l kids uh, in Harshal's family have a lot of questions, so I'm going to rattle through these. Uh, Susie, I'll start with you. Were velociraptors as smart as shown in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies? Probably not, though it's difficult to say. They definitely did have um, some quite big brains and some good senses, but um, they couldn't open doors like that, mainly because they couldn't rotate their wrists like that. They had to keep their wrists. They were clappers, not typers. Um, they, we don't know whether or not they hunted in packs. We don't have any evidence for that. Um, so, uh, for the sake of brevity, probably not. Uh, Paul, this for you. Is there a dinosaur for every letter of the alphabet? Oh, yes, I think there is. Wow, you played the the alphabet <laughs> game in your head there really <laughs> quickly. Very impressive. I think there is. I'm willing. I'm willing to be proved wrong. But is I'm that a pu that must be a pub quiz question? When paleontologists get together for a, you know, when they're allowed in a pub, that okay. surely that's got to be a I'm pub quiz question. The hard letters in my head, and I can think of an X, a Z, uh, and a Q. So I think we're probably all right. Well, anyone watching this, if you want to double check now, and we'll, we'll make sure that Paul was uh, instinctively correct at that point. Uh, Susie, did all dinosaurs mate for life, or maybe species? Only, if only, which ones? We don't know. We don't have any evidence for that sort of behaviour in the fossil record because for most dinosaurs, all we have is their bones, their footprints, sometimes their footprints, sometimes a bit of egg, uh, and sometimes, as Paul said, a bit of poo. But, but that's pretty much it. So behaviour like that is really hard to tell. Right now.
Right, now we've got about 10 questions left. We're going to see how many we can get through. I don't think we are going to make it all the way through. Uh, but just a reminder again, if you can donate to the tip jar, that's fantastic. We're going to be giving some of those donations uh, to the Etc. Theatre uh, in Camden this week. And uh, also it is used to keep making all the shows that we make. We make lots of different shows uh, during the week. Or you can support us via Patreon. And now uh, this is uh, from Rami. Hello, Rami. Uh, if dinosaurs had not been wiped out by a comet, would they now be in charge? Um, in some ways I wish they were because they <laughs> would maybe have done a better job of some things than other creatures um, but actually as I said dinosaurs uh, from my point of view the really interesting dinosaurs were wiped out but we still have lots of dinosaurs around today uh, because they're birds and actually one place on earth which did have dinosaurs in charge until very recently was New Zealand and New Zealand had a landscape that was dominated by birds, so now mainly sadly extinct due to the arrival of humans. But for many uh, hundreds of thousands of years, New Zealand was actually, birds were in charge. There were no mammals, really, except for the old bats and things like that. And so if you wanted to see a dinosaur ecosystem, that is the one you would have seen um, until very recently. So at least one natural experiment in what happens when birds take over. Now, if your list of why you want to live in New Zealand, Zealand wasn't long enough already, and I know most of us are, now, now there's another one thrown in there as well. Uh, this is from Rod Susie. Uh, Rod would like to know, could a meteorite strike be precise and specific enough only to make a tiny subsection of a species extinct? I think it's specific. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I, I suspect not. I suspect not. I think, you know, these big meteor strikes have major global... Um, or the, that, that killed the dinosaurs certainly had major global effects that that affected all the ecosystems on earth um so I, I suspect that more than one part of one species could go extinct unless maybe one just i don't know like hit the house of commons or something right this is for all three of you this from alistair if you this from alistair is there a previously accepted dinosaur uh, which is now proved not to exist that you miss more than any other Shall I do the easy? Like, yeah, go on, go on. Because I, obviously I know, not having become a paleontologist, I, there is, I think there are, it's not really, it's a half answer because a lot of the dinosaur models I had when I was a kid were wrong because people made assumptions about how dinosaurs stood. So the iguanodon that Susie mentioned before, the model I had as a kid was this kind of upright thing with its thumb sticking up like this. Um, and, you know, since then, people have got better at comparative physiology and working out how bones have to arrange themselves. So I think, I don't know about dinosaurs that have existed, although, you know, been disappeared for, by, although I think there's been a few, but I do think a lot of them have looked you know, if you showed people pictures of dinosaurs now and, and those dinosaurs from 50 years ago, they wouldn't recognise a lot of them because they don't look... It's a bit like the dodo. You know, the one sample that we got was a bit weird and people did odd things to it and then everyone assumed dodos look like that. And actually, there's been a lot of reinterpretation, I think. So that's my answer. Um, OK, uh, there's a dinosaur called that was originally called Dynamosaurus, which has later been found to be T-Rex. Now... I too am um, not a massive fan of T-Rex because like Paul, I feel that it is overexposed. Um, but this particular specimen was actually the first specimen of T-Rex to be dug up and it is in our collection in the Natural History Museum. Um, so I th and also Dinosaurus, what a cool name. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would. Paul? There is actually a really, really obscure, there's one, there's a thing called really obscure, there's one, there's a thing called Dinosaurus, actually Dinosaurus. And it would be nice to have that as a name for a dinosaur. But actually, I think, if my memory's right, it's actually based on a bit of fossil wood. Um, and as a result, isn't a dinosaur at all, which is a bit of a shame that, like, one obvious name for a dinosaur is, is totally useless as far as dinosaurs are um, now, this one is, uh, Susie, I'll go with you. This is from Terence, uh, just in the live chat. Do you like Jurassic Park because, yay, dinosaurs? Or does it annoy you because it has so many factual errors? film um you know it, it doesn't matter about the factual areas does it it's a film who cares it's great can uh, i also say i have been to the place can uh, i also say i have been to the place on earth which is probably closest to jurassic park so there's a place in alabama where they store up dna from all current animals with the idea of reviving um extinct species and i have been there and you drive down the alleyway and it's got these massive great big wire fences with big lush tropical things coming down and you swear you're in jurassic park and then you walk into these labs hidden in these little huts in the forest and they've got these 
rats that have like whole zoos worth of DNA stored in liquid nitrogen. Um, so they're mostly trying to resurrect tigers and, you know, things that are slightly more recent. Exactly. However, it was disconcerting that something quite so close to Jurassic Park genuinely <laughs> exists. Now, this is uh, from Marcus. Marcus, or it's not actually, it's from his 12-year-old nephew, uh, who would like to know, are we getting dinosaurs wrong? And maybe they could have actually lived underground. Susie? Um, we do actually have some burrowing dinosaurs, yeah. We do have evidence for dinosaurs that burrowed. Um, dinosaurs probably occupied pretty much every kind of ecological uh, space that, that mammals do today. So we know we had flying dinosaurs, we know we had burrowing dinosaurs, and there's some recent evidence that we might even have had some swimming dinosaurs that lived in, in, in lakes and rivers and things like that as well. So um, yeah, well, they probably did live underground, and in fact we do have some evidence for that. Uh, now we've got. Uh, uh, now we've got. Uh, I'm just trying to work out. That. Let's go for uh, Ghost Poppy. Would like to know uh, how do we know what dinosaurs look like when we only have the fossils? How do so basically? I suppose how do we build that picture of their structure? Uh, so we use the bones to start with, and we start off by comparing those with the bones of living animals, and that gives us clues on where things like muscles attach which then allow us to come up, if you like, with the outside of the animal, how all those muscles attach over the skeleton, form the overall shape. Sometimes we're lucky enough to find fossils of things like skin impressions, which is how we know that some dinosaurs had feathers versus scaly skin, and we're able then to put the skin on top of the animals. And we basically use living animals as our guide. So we know, for example, that all living animals have a heart and lungs and guts and all those kinds of things, so we know that they all have to fit inside the dinosaur somehow, and we can use our information on those to make kind of educated guesses about what they would have looked like on the inside as well. So we use living animals very much as a template, and then we use the extra information that we get from the fossils to fill out the details of those pictures. One of the things, sorry, I'm going to jump in again. Is one of the most blowing things, if you look at fossils through history, and, and it is really obvious in places like the Brea Tarpets, is that they, they look so similar. Like when you look at the skeleton of a cow and the skeleton of a T-Rex and the skeleton of, you know, um, the Stegosaurus, fundamentally, they've got legs, they've got shoulder blades, they've got ribs. They've got all the same bits for millions and millions of years. And that is the thing about um, animal physiology more than anything else that blows my mind is that you've got this basic body map that just doesn't change because it was so good. But that's what let people like Paul do that because the same rules apply. You're just kind of pushing and pulling on them in different I would agree. I think that is a remarkable thing that there's an incredible variety of life on the planet Earth. But actually, as you said, the, the design, once, once you design, I should be careful using that term. But if you say what once through natural selection, mutation, heredity, that you get that, that that structure is the one that kind of a lot of variations, but predominant. Um, this is uh, so what should we have? Um, uh, well, I think you've all done your favorite dinosaur, haven't you? Pretty much because uh, Bethy anywhere would like to tell you now she's team Steg. Um, so uh, yeah, hashtag. T so Susie agrees there with you, Bethy, for uh, team Steg. And uh, do we just assume this from sound aspects? Do we just assume dinosaurs are only in autumn collection shades because we lack imagination? Now I suppose actually, really, that's changed a lot, hasn't it, in the twenty first century in terms of the colours and the possibilities. So, so Paul. Yeah, so when I used to give talks about dinosaurs, I always used to say we will never know what colour a dinosaur actually was. And the last few years have shown that there might be ways in some cases of actually finding the original colour. So with some of the feathered dinosaurs in particular, looking at microscopic structures in their feathers gives clues as to what those colours might have been. And the ones that they've so far been finding evidence for are a range of browns, russets, uh, blacks and whites. So I'm afraid we are looking very much at that autumn collection uh, palette. Uh, but there might be other ways that we could find out about those colors. For example, blues and greens in the natural world, sometimes they're made by pigments, but sometimes they're also made by the actual structures that we're looking at, whether the structure of the scale or the structure of the feather and little microscopic differences in those give those different uh, colors to those uh, different features. So it could be that uh, in another 10 years time, uh, some clever research group somewhere will have worked out how to do that as well. And we might start filling out these patterns. And after all, birds are living dinosaurs, some of the most colourful animals that are around today with the full range of kind of scarlets and iridescent blues and that kind of thing. And it wouldn't surprise me if at least some of our usual elephant or rhino grey dinosaurs end up being a bit more colourful in future. And uh, would, would you agree, Susie? Yeah, absolutely. You know, some... 
some of the more modern reconstructions of dinosaurs are, are beginning to show that. I was looking at a really beautiful picture of a, a red and blue stripy triceratops the other day. Um, so, yeah. Well, some of them are stripy. So one of the Chinese dinosaurs that Chinese dinosaurs that came back to the UK recently, the tail they thought had red and white stripes, and you could actually see that, as Paul was saying, in the pigments that were left. So there are hints there now that, yeah, they could it could be very pretty. They're very pretty patterns as well. So uh, uh, thank you. I'm sorry by the way that we uh, many of you we didn't. I'm sorry to Damien, to Hugh, to John, Badger thirty three, a lot of other people as well. We didn't get to all your questions. We knew dinosaurs was going to be a busy one. Um, thank you very much to uh, to Susie, to Paul, to Helen. Uh, next week we are back with uh, it's going to be chemistry with uh, Safal Islam and Andrea Sella, and obviously uh, Helen as well. And uh, far less paleontology, Helen. There's going to be so many more questions for you. There's not just going to be that one. I mean, I presume Sophie's a friend, you know, sneaking in that amber bubble based <laughs> question. I. I I, I can't I, it's very interesting to learn from people who know all the things about dinosaurs that I never got to learn. So I've enjoyed listening. Do you feel now, do you feel a greater level of envy than at five past three? Or are you still reasonably happy um, with the direction you I'm went in? I'm still all right with being an Earth physicist because I get to find out how the Earth works, works right? right? So I'm, 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 you know, I, I'm still happy with what I get to look at. But they oh, can I, find out about the colourful, fuzzy, feathered dinosaurs and then come back and tell me. Yeah, I don't think in any obsolete by this conversation Helen uh, so um, uh, also mention again as we said Festival of Spoken Nerd have a new uh, podcast series that's come out and uh, we will be back not this week but next week with another genetic shambles uh, catch up with uh, um, also can I just ask in terms of uh, lockdown Natural History Museum um, what are the best ways if people uh, at the moment I presume there is some visiting going on but uh, there's online stuff going on as well isn't there hasn't that increased during, during lockdown um, Susie or, or Paul on that um there's, we're reduced capacity, so you need to go online onto our website, which is nhm.ac.uk, and um, book uh, a time slot. It's a free ticket, but you need to um, book it. Um, and we do have to wear masks in the galleries. Not every gallery is open. Some of them are shut if they're a bit they're a bit squished in there. Um, online, there's been loads and loads of content um, going on online. Uh, yeah, over the whole of lockdown, and, and it continues to do so. So our our public engagement and science communication team has been working really, really hard. There's loads of stuff going on there, so do take a look. Brilliant. Thank you all very much. Uh, also, remind you the latest book, uh, also remind you the latest book shambles is uh, with Ruby Wax, and uh, had a lovely conversation with her and, and Josie the other day. Very optimistic conversation, as usual. The news today and uh, the various uh, duplicities that we've been reading about may well not uh, fill you with uh, verve and excitement to be a human being. But uh, Ruby's book has got some lovely things there, including all the different companies that are now looking at greater ideas of purpose over profit, amongst other things. So you can listen to that on book shambles. Thank you very much to our producer Trent. Burton and uh, if we don't see you before we'll see you uh, next Sunday for our chemistry special at 3pm as usual bye bye